Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and this right here is the face of Triumph. A huge triumph for the team behind the NASA's helicopter that was able to achieve its main mission. It was able to prove that indeed you can actually fly in the thin Martian atmosphere. With the first initial pictures of the actual flight being right here, this is the pictures taken by the NASA's Perseverance probe, and this black and white image showing us what it actually saw while it was flying. What you're looking at here is basically the shadow of the helicopter as it's hovering approximately 9 feet or 3 meters above the surface. And by itself, this is a huge achievement, not just for NASA and not just for the team behind the helicopter, but really for the humanity as a whole. Because just like back in 1903 with the first powered flight by the Wright brothers, NASA has now symbolically showed us that we can also achieve the powered flight on other planets as well. And in this case, not just any planet, a planet with extremely thin atmosphere. So these simple images represent a huge legacy for the human beings. But because this was only announced a few hours ago from when I'm actually finishing this video, there's very little I can share with you except for this, also this, and lastly, the altimeter data, or basically the data of the height of the helicopter, as it essentially ascended, stayed around the altitude of 3 meters or 9 feet for roughly around 30 seconds, and then gently landed back on the ground. And by itself, this was already everything NASA, or specifically this team from NASA, were trying to achieve with this mission. They were trying to prove that it's possible for a powered aircraft, specifically a helicopter in this case, to operate in this atmosphere. It was also possible to do all of this autonomously without really any interaction from the humans, while also only relying on the solar panels to charge its batteries and relying on the internal heater system to provide the necessary conditions for all of the computer systems to operate nominally. And because the helicopter was able to survive several Martian nights by itself, with the temperatures reaching like minus 90 degrees Celsius, or about minus 130 degrees Fahrenheit, all of this suggests that not only can these uh, devices operate on the surface, pretty much everything that the scientists set up to do, and everything they expected the mission to achieve, has already been achieved with this 39 second flight. Now interestingly here, despite the shortness of the flight and despite the fact that we only so far have those few pictures, there are going to be so many different really interesting investigations happening in the next few days, trying to establish everything we know so far about both the Martian atmosphere when it comes to powered flight, and also trying to see if all of the predicted data matches the observed data, basically trying to understand if the models we have about Martian atmosphere are correct or if they need to be corrected. One specific issue that the scientists are actually kind of curious to explore is something that is quite familiar to us here on Earth, but doesn't really cause as much trouble usually. Except I guess it caused some trouble to this guy right here. I'm talking about static electricity. Now, unlike Earth, the problem with Martian atmosphere is that first of all it's extremely dry, but also it has a lot of dust in the atmosphere. Dust that has already accumulated right here on top of the panels as you can see in this image from NASA, that was taken only a few days after the helicopter was released from the rover. And the thing is when the blades start spinning really fast, a lot of this dust will start colliding with the blade at extremely fast velocities, which can eventually lead to a really large buildup of electric charge which then can lead to, well, basically this. All of these dust particles are going to start interacting in a similar manner to what you expect to happen when, for example, you rub a balloon on your hair and the hair starts sticking to the balloon. And so this one team at NASA believes that a lot of this can actually lead to some serious problems later on, possibly creating some sort of a large dust cloud around the helicopter, possibly even causing some sort of a discharge or maybe even a tiny lightning, and more importantly, it might even cause problems to the electronics on board the helicopter. All of which will have to be examined and analyzed as more and more flights are conducted in order to see if there's actually any danger to using this type of flight on the planet. Now, the team behind this helicopter is planning to do at least five flights and each flight is going to be a little bit more difficult than the previous one. And so hopefully by the time the fifth flight is conducted, we're going to have maybe enough data to establish if the static electricity and dust on Mars is indeed a problem like assumed in this particular study you can find in the description below. And so if after about three weeks when the official mission is going to be over, helicopter kind of starts resembling this poor cat right here, we know that the static is definitely going to be a problem for all of the future missions as well. And this is something that the scientists or actually astronauts one day traveling to Mars will need to be really aware of. 
And so the data coming from this mission is going to be absolutely crucial for the future missions to Mars as well. And unfortunately, these images here are not going to be enough for us to see if there's really any electrical discharge or any electrical interference from all of the static. But right now, a lot of scientists behind the study believe that as the helicopter goes above the ground, it essentially isolates itself from, well, really everything else. And as the blades start spinning ridiculously fast, basically about 2400 RPM, which is actually about 7 to 8 times faster than a typical helicopter here on planet Earth, this literally kind of acts like a typical Van der Graaff generator. Basically, it produces the static energy that then, well, for one, can do this to your hair, but naturally can also cause a lot of electrical damage and possibly even completely destroy the helicopter as it literally touches the Martian surface, because then the electric charge can basically fry the electric parts on the inside. And so what happens to Ingenuity helicopter after a few weeks of testing is going to be extremely interesting to investigate. And so make sure to subscribe because I'm definitely going to be following this up with another video sometime in the next few weeks. But before we finish, there are still some facts I wanted to mention about this particular mission or about this particular event, just to help you understand how extremely complex all of this was. So first of all, because of the current location of Mars in the solar system compared to planet Earth, it's important to understand how complex the communication route is in order for scientists to do all of this. So last week they were planning to do the mission on Monday, but unfortunately there was a bug detected in the software that uh, did not allow the helicopter to enter the flight mode correctly. So the scientists had a few options there, but they decided to basically re-upload the entire software to the helicopter, resetting the entire operating system of the helicopter and essentially letting it do its test run once again. And as you can probably imagine, because of the distances involved, this took quite a while. First of all, the data had to go to the so-called Deep Space Network, which are these three massive radio antenna located in three separate parts of the world, allowing NASA to cover a really, really large part of the night skies. This then sent all of the data to the Martian orbiter, which receives the data and then relays it back to Perseverance rover, which then has to use its tiny antenna to first receive the data and then relay it back to the helicopter. And then once the helicopter gets the data and reboots everything, recalculates all of its parameters, it has to return all of the testing parameters and all of its testing data following the same route, but this time backwards. And apparently all of this takes approximately four hours. And so by the time that the flight officially has already finished, it took approximately four hours to get the data, to get the images, and to get the official confirmation that the flight was successful. And so if you do get to watch the live feed from the NASA scientists reporting this, they're basically just waiting for all of this data to come in. But the flight on the actual testing has already been completed about four hours prior. Although naturally they had no idea if it was a success or a failure, which is why NASA was reporting on this. But sometime in the next few days, we're probably also going to be getting some color pictures from the helicopter because it does have two cameras. One, the navigation camera is black and white, and that's of course the image you see here, but the color camera did not really transmit its images yet. So there are definitely going to be a lot more images coming in, and I'm probably going to be just sharing them in the description as the story gets updated. And so it will probably take a few days for all of the images and all of the data to be finally relayed completely and for all of the information to be available for the scientists to investigate and to analyze. And so definitely a super exciting mission and also a very important milestone for all of us, for the human beings. But at the same time, there are so many new things we're going to be learning in the next few weeks. Now, I'm particularly interested in the whole static electricity thing, but at the same time, there are still going to be a lot more interesting things we'll discover that we can't even imagine right now, which is why this is probably one of the more important missions of the last few decades. But I'll definitely come back and talk more about this as we discover more cool information or some unusual facts about perseverance or ingenuity. Until then, well, in summary, it managed to fly after all, it spent approximately 39.1 seconds in flight, it reached the altitude of about 3 meters or 9 feet, the blades were spinning at about 2400 RPM and each blade here is about 1.2 meters in diameter, and at the same time it was able to take a snapshot of its own shadow as it was hovering above the ground, with the Perseverance being able to take a few shots as well from the hill where it was located. And so on that note, let's see what the scientists discover and huge congratulations to the entire team behind this mission. This is an incredible achievement and something that none of us could imagine a few years ago. 
Anyway, thank you for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and come back tomorrow to learn something else. Maybe support this channel Patreon by joining the channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt that I'm wearing in the description below. And either way, stay wonderful. I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.